I'm pleased to introduce our next panel. Joining me on stage is Seth Gray, who leads Lightbridge Corp, which is working to develop and deploy advanced nuclear reactor fuel that will result in more electricity being provided from existing and new reactors to allow nuclear power to compete and grow internationally as a non-emitting source of baseload electricity. On Lightbridge's board is Professor Professorial Lecturer of Johns Hopkins University and President Emeritus of the Center for International Environmental Law, Dan McGraw. He is an international lawyer with expertise in environmental protection, climate change, and human rights. Thank you for joining me, gentlemen. We also have with us Asa Peterson, the CEO of Sweet Energy, a non-for-profit industry and special interest organization for companies that supply, distribute, sell, and store energy. Asa has previously worked as the head of sustainability for Vattenfall and Scania. Finally joining us via Zoom is Natalia katzer Buchkovska, former member of parliament of Ukraine from 2014 to 2019. What a fantastic panel we have here. Okay, so Seth, I'm going to start with you. We've been hearing that we need to transition to clean, green energy for global security. We've been hearing what that would look like. And we just heard from Daniel the role that nuclear needs to play in that as well. Talk to us from your vantage point, the role of nuclear in supporting a stable global economy. Well, well, as Daniel Agater was saying, I think it's essential. It's something that's been proven for decades. It's something that can be deployed, run, uh, at all times of day. Uh, the current nuclear power plants are very large. They operate 24-7. They tend to be, you know, as Daniel said, very expensive, take years to deploy. And we're moving now toward these smaller modular reactors that are being designed to be built in factories or shipyards and deployed in large numbers in many more countries and more affordable. Uh, more easily financed. So I do think that as we're moving to having these smaller, uh, cheaper reactors, nuclear will continue to play a role in 24-7 power and also with new technologies, reactors uh, with advanced fuels that will be able to go up and down in power, balancing renewables as the sun shines and the wind blows. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Also, when we think about Sweden and the exports from Sweden, we think about cars, paper, iron, steel. But fossil fuel free electricity is also a export from Sweden. So now with the EU trying to move away from Russian energy, the need for this electricity is even greater. So how can Sweden help to meet this need and help the EU achieve better energy security overall? Thank you very much. Very relevant question. Yeah, Sweden uh, has today uh, in the electricity mix around 98-99% uh, fossil free electricity. So indeed that's a very good starting point. And as you say, I mean we're an integrated electricity market, there is an, a potential to export this, but there is of course an even greater potential to use this electricity to make fossil free products uh, and export the products. So I mean Sweden, are, we are standing just as uh, uh, the rest of the world in the, in the midst of this transition uh, and there are a lot of uh, projects for example, uh, we are very far ahead in, in uh, looking into producing fossil-free steel with, with electricity and hydrogen uh, as the base. So, I mean, using electricity to produce clean hydrogen and then producing fossil-free steel would make an even greater value out of this export uh, of the electricity. Uh, but, of course, to achieve that, we need to, as a country, double uh, the electricity consumption compared to what we have today. So we need to build another energy system, the same as the one we have today to achieve this. Uh, and that electricity needs to be fossil free, renewable. Okay, so what I'm hearing is this taxonomy has to really include clean energy sources, nuclear, hydrogen. And Natalia, this is something you have been working on even before the war. You were supporting a clean energy future for Ukraine. And you're thinking ahead. You're thinking to the end of the war, and you're thinking how, we're, how Ukraine is going to transition to clean energy. Why? Tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing and why it's so important to think ahead uh, through the devastation that's occurring right now to a brighter, cleaner future for Ukraine. 
Uh, good evening for everyone. Thank you, Shada, for this question. So, for sure, we should think ahead. And uh, uh, well, first of all, Ukraine is the center of Europe, and we have a very sophisticated uh, energy system, which is like 30% coal, 57% uh, nuclear. Uh, we have gas and uh, only 12% of renewables. So after war will end, uh, for sure, uh, we need to think, and we have the chance to or first of all, redesign the energy system. Now Ukraine is under serious attack and a lot of our energy system are uh, destroyed. So uh, at, at the first time, we have a serious shock and need to substitute energy by different means, generation by different means, as well as in Europe, they are also working on the redirection of energy flows, gas, uh, even someone use coal as a, a supplement uh, generation. Uh, just in short term. In middle term, we have a chance to redesign the whole uh, electricity system, including Ukraine, and make it more sustainable. Because, yes, from the one side, we can say uh, we can now everyone is working to stop transiting Russian gas and oil. Uh, but from the other side, uh, there is a movement towards increasing the oil production. And today, European countries said that they will be increasing it by 15 percent. So future is unpredictable. We don't know for sure what would be the design. And now, uh, after I left Parliament, I set up a Ukrainian uh, a green infrastructure fund, which uh, uh, Ukrainian sustainable fund, which uh, uh, should design this new system, and we are working to attract the funds and investment to green transition after post-war, in course of post-war recovery. So first of all, we need to think now in advance to set up uh, the correct system and the right frame to rebuild Ukraine in more sustainable green way. Uh, well, now it's the right time because, uh, like, we have time, we have uh, to think, uh, and uh, then the, when they will be rebuilding of Ukraine, we can implement all this strategy. So why don't we think it about now and, uh, like, use this opportunity also to uh, start something greenly new and uh, to rebuild Ukraine in a sustainable way? Incredible. And Natalia, you've been a politician, you've been in a position of decision making, and we're talking about something very close to your heart, your own country. And so thank you for sharing that with us. And we're coming back to you uh, to hear more about your experiences in Ukraine as well. Um, but let me turn to you, Dan. So as a lawyer, talk to us and somebody who's worked in human rights. Talk to us about the relationship between human rights abuses and dirty energy, fossil fuels. And why is it more critical than ever? Here is case in point, what we're currently seeing in Ukraine. Well, dirty energy affects human rights in many, many ways. Uh, for the audience, uh, a basic starting point is that environmental harm uh, impacts human rights. And if you think about it, it's pretty obvious, but it took us a while to get here. But um, it, uh, it affects the right to life. Uh, if you're poisoned, it affects the right to property, the right to uh, own and use culture or enjoy culture. Um, so that's a starting point. If we look at what um, dirty energy does, one thing it does is just the ambient uh, uh, pollution from dirty energy uh, affects people's health and their livelihood and their lives. Uh, if we look at climate change, there are several impacts of, of uh, dirty energy on climate change. One is it, it just it affects the enjoyment of things like uh, the right to enjoy culture. The Inuit can't uh, hunt the way they used to before. Um, again, for this audience, I don't need to explain the different risks that that climate change is, is raising. But if we look at, at right here in this part of the world, the tree line is moving north at about 130 feet per year. That's not a marginal change. It's a massive change. That's going to destroy the culture of the Sami. And that's a, an example of how human rights impact, or excuse me, climate change impacts human rights. Um, it, it also uh, uh, affects migration, of course, because people are going to be moving internally uh, as displaced persons and across borders. And, and that uh, can cause tremendous havoc for the countries in which they move, but the people that are moving are also, their human rights are being affected as well. And, um, you know, we've, we've seen the kind of disruption that can come from, from over-dependence on dirty fuels as well that Natalia just 
described and, and the previous speakers. The final point I'd make is some of the, the remedies that are being suggested now uh, are extremely dangerous in themselves. One is to spread a level of aerosols around the world to, to reflect more sunlight back into space. Uh, we don't know uh, anything about that, really. Sweden was involved in some experiments. Uh, they've stopped now, I think. But that kind of idea is extremely dangerous and uh, could easily affect um, the production of food around the world, especially for small uh, holders, and, and then impact the right to food. So th that's just a, an example. Wow, thank you. No, great information. Um, we need to make sure that we are able to put these innovations, not the ones that are dangerous, but the ones that have a lot of promise. We need to make sure that they reach commercial viability. But some technologies don't even get there because of public perceptions and pushback. And there's these perceptions around nuclear safety and pr proliferation that you contend with on a regular basis, Seth. So what is Lightbridge and the wider sector doing to address this and what can nuclear's role actually be in clean electricity? Well, nuclear safety and proliferation are a major focus of the nuclear power industry and every company in it. What we are doing now, in addition to better regulation, better operation of the plants, is non-proliferation and safety by design. So at Lightbridge, in our advanced nuclear technology, we are significantly advancing the safety and non-proliferation and other benefits of the technology itself. So it's like in addition to speed limits for cars, have airbags, have technology that, that has the safety. And as we've heard said throughout the, the day, we, we just don't have time to replace fossil fuels with something that we don't know if it will work. We don't have time to wait for carbon capture from the atmosphere or from smokestacks economically, globally, so that we can continue to use fossil fuels. We don't have time for battery backup of cities to power Beijing at night or season to season from renewables. We do have time to massively produce much more nuclear power in these smaller, more quickly deployed units. Lightbridge is developing the fuel that will power them more efficiently with enhanced non-proliferation, with enhanced safety. And we're trying to be the answer that says, yes, we do have time to do this and to deploy it on a massive scale. Thank you for sharing that, Seth. So we really need to move our dependence and we don't have time. We have to remove our dependence from fossil fuels and we need to bring new technologies uh, in the pipeline, but really deploy what we already have now. And Natalia, you know this better than anyone. You had a harrowing experience fleeing Ukraine, following the Russian aggression. Talk to us a little bit about your experience and why it's more important than ever to remove our dependence from fossil fuels so no sovereign country has to go through what you went through. Well, it's a very good question. Uh, so you know that uh, now uh, we face, as Ukrainians, we face this tremendous challenge. We are going through the active phase of hybrid war. It's not just physical um, physical invasion of our country, but the Russian troops. Russia also used the different means like energy and gas. It always was a political tool to suppress and to manipulate by others states, but now it's a weapon. It's a hybrid weapon in hybrid uh, warfare. So uh, why here? Before, uh, before I've been in parliament, I argued that the Nord Stream 2 over-dependence of Europe from Russia's fossil fuels would have a far-reaching consequence. Now, finally, people understand that, yes, we need to move from this fossil dictatorship and this country misused the dominance position. And uh, first of all, it's about uh, it's about influence over the decision. And, uh, and, and now we have the consequences that this uh, country uh, invade independent state in the center of Europe. So now uh, Europe faced with a like, very urgent shock and trying to redesign uh, their 
uh, energy system, uh, gas flows. Uh, it's not possible just to, to jump from fossil fuels to renewables in one in one uh, like day or, or, or even year. But uh, now it's a very critical time uh, when we have a chance to redesign because it could be different ways. It's not only we are thinking we'll switch from Russian gas and oil and it would be renewables and green energy it could be even more dependence on fossil fuels because some countries start using coal and they back to coal just to uh, to uh, like uh, cover this deficit in electricity and energy production to lower the price and uh, here as we are like speaking with uh, the audience who actually devoted to sustainability and green transition, I suppose we should be very allowed to switch policy 100% towards sustainable paths, because like it could be very different scenarios. So in middle term, as I said, there is a chance to make a new design. And in long term, I suppose the war in Ukraine would be like a turning point towards sustainability and it could ex even accelerate the transition. Uh, so from my experience, I've been a member of parliament for five years. We designed, we have zero renewables in our system. And now we have 12% of renewables in our system, which is quite complicated for country who could not afford a, a like very high prices for electricity, but we still did it. Ukraine has tremendous chances and uh, has a big, uh, big potential, very big potential and resources for first of all to produce a green hydrogen, uh, solar, wind, uh, as well as uh, other alternative fuels uh, for Europe for themselves. It would be totally independent from fossil fuels. If now, for instance. Uh, organization will focus, uh, international organization will focus and help us to create this new design. And after, as I said, we will end it. It's a very uh, critical to redirect all recovery funds, which would Ukraine receive from international different countries towards renewables, not, not other ways. Uh, and it's not only energy, it's other in agriculture, I mean, infrastructure, also other different, uh, like energy efficiency building, which would be rebuilt from the scratch city, we have a chance to redesign it. So this is the key message. So let's let's think now and let's not allow for, to use this, uh, this crisis to back to fossil fuels to more dependence, but let's uh, use this chance to create a fund them, uh, uh, trade the ground to much more uh, quicker and efficient transition. Yes, let's see, let's see the light at the end of the tunnel here and how we can really usher in a future that is clean, it's more equitable, and it has the support of the Ukrainian people. And let that be an example that can be scaled, that can be applied to other countries as well. And thank you, Natalia. Stay safe. Um, stay on with us. I will move to Asa. So Sweden is, of course, a member of the EU. And we've recently had in the EU a debate on the new taxonomy. What are your thoughts on this taxonomy? And should nuclear energy be labeled as sustainable? No, yeah, but I think, like Natalia is saying, we really need to grab this opportunity of redesign and getting out of this uh, dependence on fossil fuel. Nuclear is one part of the solution. If you look at the Swedish energy system today, it's, we are 30% uh, uh, electricity production uh, around that from nuclear power. Uh, but there is no silver bullet. We need to use all available uh, sources for electricity production. The taxonomy is an important tool because it guides uh, <laughs> the financial sector into what is a, a good and sustainable investment. So I think it's important then to be able to include all fossil free solutions into, I mean, nuclear power is not renewable, but it is fossil free and we need to move away from the carbon dependence. So including nuclear power in the taxonomy is an important step not to, to, to exclude it. At the same time, nuclear power is not a quick fix either. I mean, so we 
we need to focus on what, what's the most uh, fast available uh, production source today is, is wind power. I mean, that's what is being built. Is the only wind uh, is the only power source that has been built in Sweden during the past years, and the only thing that it's source that is being built right now. And so we need to enable the build out of wind power. We need to uh, uh, not put up obstacles for nuclear power. We, we need to we need all the solutions. Hydropower, as you mentioned in your interview from Davos. I mean, all these solutions need to be at hand because we we need them all. And actually, the biggest hurdle here is not the discussion on what source uh, to use; is the permitting processes. <laughs> it is it is right. this very very concrete hurdle. Uh, it takes too much time to get permits to build anything at all. And like we've been repeating so many times in these panels, we don't have that time. Mm. So actually, it's not about not having time for that or that source. It's about not having time for these permitting processes. And that goes both for the production and also for the grids, because we need the electrical grids. And at the end of the day, this is a very big uh, issue of democracy and human rights, because this is all about social acceptance. Yep. We didn't have to take these decisions as fast in a previous era, because we we, weren't, uh, we didn't have to get out of this dependency of fossil fuels so fast, and we weren't facing this electrification that is, is, is the answer to how to get out of the fossil fuels. So we need to rebuild also our democratic and bureaucratic, bureaucratic processes together to include everyone, everyone and uh, um, it's about social acceptance yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah. No, thank you for sharing those thoughts. And Dan, I know you have reflections on what we've been talking about, and do you agree? Uh, well, I'd love to hear your thoughts as we close out this panel. But really, will this happen? Can we actually usher in a clean energy future that is equitable? We can, and the ideas have already been mentioned, accessibility, affordability, acceptability, sustainability. We have to keep in mind that climate change, although it's an existential threat, is only one of the big problems. So it's a matter of political will, and that may be, have to be supplied by the youth. We'll see. I was expecting a little bit more as a lecturer at Johns Hopkins University, but I love how concise and to the point that was. Appreciate each of you contributing your expertise and your time. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Asa. Thank you, Seth. Thank you, Natalia, my friend. Stay safe. And um, thank you.